The Lacanian Subject by Bruce Fink. Uh, this is chapter four, also called The Lacanian Subject. Even when structuralism was alive and well, subjectivity was often taken to be incompatible with the notion of structure. Structure seemed to exclude the very possibility of the existence of a subject, and the assertion of subjectivity seemed to undermine a structuralist position. With the advent of post-structuralism, the very concept of subjectivity seems to have become unfashionable, and Lacan is one of the few contemporary thinkers to have devoted considerable effort to its elaboration. Lacan, well dubbed a structuralist by certain people and a post-structuralist by others, maintains and defends both concepts, structure and subject, in a rigorous theoretical framework. Nevertheless, as he strips the subject of so many of the characteristics usually attributed to it in Western thought, and relentlessly exposes the workings of structure in psychoanalytic and literary contexts, it is not always easy to see what role is left to the subject in Lacan's work. The difficulty for the reader of Lacan's texts is compounded by the fact that his attempt to isolate the subject takes many different forms at different points in his teaching, not all of which seem to converge on any easily recognizable conception of subjectivity. I will not try to demonstrate the existence of the, of the Lacanian subject, for no such demonstration is possible. As Lacan says in Seminar 23, the subject is never more than supposed. In other words, the subject is never more than an assumption on our part. It does, however, seem to be a necessary assumption for Lacan, a, con a construct without which psychoanalytic experience cannot be accounted for. In that sense, its status is similar to that of what Freud calls the second phase of the fantasy, a child is being beaten. The second phase being the thought, I am being beaten by my father. Freud remarks, the second phase is the most important and most momentous of all, but we may say of it in a certain sense that it has never had a real existence. It is never remembered. It is never succeeded in becoming conscious. It is a construction of analysis but it is no less a necessity on that account. My hope is to lend credence to this Lacanian construct by discussing a whole series of tacks Lacan takes in his endeavor to close in on it from the 1950s on, thereby indicating where structure leaves off and subjectivity begins. A number of illustrations and metaphors will be provided, which I hope will furnish a basic grasp of the notion. Its more theoretical underpinning will be explained further on. I will begin my discussion with an indication of what the Lacanian subject is not, as it seems to me that nothing should be taken for granted in understanding Lacan's use of the term. The Lacanian subject, oops, the Lacanian subject is not the individual or conscious subject of Anglo-American philosophy. It should be mentioned right from the outset that, whereas in English one would usually speak of an, alis an alisand as a patient, an individual, or in certain schools of psychology as a client, in French one would quite naturally refer to him or her as a subject. There's nothing specifically conceptual or theoretical about the use of the term subject in such contexts. It refers no more to the Lacanian subject I will attempt to isolate here, then does the appellation le malade, the patient, or more literally translated, the sick person, the person who is ill. Such non-theoretical terms are used more or less interchangeably in Lacan's early work in particular. The Lacanian subject is neither the individual nor what we might call the conscious subject, or the consciously thinking subject. In other words, the subject referred to by most of analytic philosophy. The consciously thinking subject is, by and large, indistinguishable from the ego as understood in the school of ego psychology, which is prevalent in the same countries in which analytic philosophy predominates. This should come as no surprise. Dominant conceptions in most cultures cross disciplinary boundaries. Now the ego, according to Lacan, arises as a, crystal as a crystallization or sedimentation of ideal images, tantamount to a fixed, fixed, 
reified object with which a child learns to identify, which a child learns to identify with him or herself. These ideal images may consist of those the child sees of him or herself in a mirror, and they are ideal in the sense that, at the stage at which mirror images begin to play an important role, 6 to 18 months, the child is quite uncoordinated and truly but an organized jumble of sensations and impulses. The mirror image presenting a unified surface appearance similar to that of the child's far more capable, coordinated, and powerful parents. Such images are invested, cathected, and internalized by a child because his or her parents make a great deal of them, insisting to their infant that the image in the mirror is him or her. Yes, baby, that's you. Other ideal images are similarly assimilated by the child, which stem from the image of him or herself reflected back from the parental other, a good girl or a bad girl, a model son, and so on. Such images derive from how the parental other sees the child and are thus linguistically structured. Indeed, it is the symbolic order that brings about the internalization of mirror and other images, e.g. photographic images, for it is primarily due to the parent's reaction to such images that they become charged in the child's eyes with libidinal interest or value, which is why mirror images are not of great interest to the child prior to about six months of age, in other words, prior to the functioning of language in the child, which occurs well before the child is able to speak. Once internalized, these various images fuse in a manner of speaking into a vast global image, which the child comes to take for him or herself. This self-image can, of course, be added to in the course of a child's life, new images being grafted upon the old. In general, it is this crystallization of images which allows for a coherent sense of self, or does not allow for it in cases in which the images are too contradictory to fuse in any way, and a great deal of our attempt to make sense of the world around us involves juxtap juxtaposing what we see and hear with this internalized self-image. How does what happens reflect upon us? Where do we fit in? Is it a challenge to our view of ourselves? This self or ego is thus, as Eastern philosophy has been telling us for millennia, a construct, a mental object, and though Freud grants it the status of an agency, in Lacan's version of psychoanalysis, the ego is clearly not an active agent, the agent of interest being the unconscious. Rather than qualifying as a seat of agency or activity, the ego is, in Lacan's view, the seat of fixation and narcissistic attachment. Moreover, it, inev it inevitably contains false images, in that mirror images are always inverted images involving a right-left reversal, and in that the communication which leads to the internalization of linguistically structured ideal images, such as your model son, is, like all communication, prone to miscommunication. The son may understand, misunderstand, that appraisal in terms of model cars and planes, viewing himself thereafter as but a miniaturized plastic version of the real thing, instead of a genuine son. The point of analysis is not to strive to give the analysand a true or correct image of him or herself, for the ego is by its very nature a distortion, an error, a repository of misunderstanding. While the ego or self is what we generally, generally refer to when we say, I think that, or I'm the kind of person who, that I is anything but the Lacanian subject, it is no more than, this, than the subject of the statement. The Lacanian subject is not the subject of the statement. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, Lacan set out to pinpoint the subject as precisely as possible, and seemed to hold out for himself a hope that a signifier of the subject could be found in statements, that is, in what is said. He was looking for a precise manifestation of the subject in discourse, and began by considering the work of grammarians and linguistics concerning the subject of a sentence. Lacan makes explicit reference on a number of occasions to Roman Jacobson's paper on shifters. In that paper, Jacobson presents the concept of code as the set of signifiers used in speaking or writing, and in a sense what Lacan calls the treasure or battery of signifiers, and the concept of message as what a speaker in fact says. 
Jacobson points out that there are one messages that refer to other messages, quotations for example, in which a previous message is included in a current one, two messages that refer to the code, as for example, puppy designates a young dog, which provides the meaning of an element of the code, in other words, its definition. Three, elements of the code that refer to the code itself, such as proper names. Four, Jerry refers to a person named named Jerry. That name designates whoever it is that bears or is called by that name. Lastly, Jacobson points out that one can find four elements in a code that refer to the message. The example he provides being that of personal pronouns, such as I, U, E, U, he, she, and so on. The meaning of that of these latter elements cannot be defined without reference to the messages in which they appear, I designating the message sender and you the message receiver or addressee. Borrowing Jesperson's term, Jacobson refers to these elements as shifters, since what they, des- what they designate changes or shifts with each new message. Jacobson's four combinations, quotations, definitions, proper names, and shifters, exhaust the possibilities offered by the concepts code and message, but do not purport to cover all parts of speech, as the vast majority of these latter are simply elements of the code. Nouns, verbs, prepositions, and so on are part and parcel of the code. Qualifying as a shifter the grammatical subject of a sentence, such as I am the kind of person who designates the message sender, and insofar as it can be said to signify the, that message sending subject, it signifies the ego, the conscious subject who thinks of him or herself as X and not Y, as generous and not miserly, as open-minded and not bigoted, and so on. The personal pronoun I designates the person who identifies his or herself with a specific ideal image. Thus, the ego is what is represented by the subject of the statement, What then of the agency or instance that interrupts the egos finds statements or botches them up? The Lacanian subject appears nowhere in what is said. Ever seeking a a precise manifestation of the subject in discourse, in the early 1960s, Lacan often attempted to peg the subject's appearance to the French word ne, literally not, one half of the French ne pas but used in many cases alone, not so much to negate in a full-fledged way, though ne alone supposes to signify negation when used with pouvoir, as to do something a bit vaguer, which Demaret and Pichon call introducing discordance. In certain expressions, the isolated use of this supposedly expletive ne is grammatically necessary, or at least more correct and more forceful than leaving it out, e.g., Avant qu'il n'arrive, pour vous qu'il ne soit arrivé, arrivé. craindre qu'il ne vienne. But it seems to introduce a certain hesitation, ambiguity, or uncertainty into the utterance in which it appears, as if to suggest that the speaker is denying the very thing he is asserting, afraid of the very thing he claims to wish, or wishing for the very thing he seems to fear. In such cases, we get the impression that the speaker both wants and does not want the event in question to take place, or the person in question to show up. In English, we have a somewhat similar situation with the word but in expressions like, I can't help but think that, meaning I can't help thinking that, where the but seems almost superfluous. Though if we translate this expression as, I can't stop myself from thinking that, it slips towards the double negative. I can't not think that, but often has the meaning of only, simply, or just. Yet in certain expressions, it seems to go beyond these meanings, taking on a connotation of negation, which can be confusing in certain circumstances, even to native speakers. For example, I can't but not wonder at his complacency. I can't but not suspect him of having done it. After all, he is my best friend. I can't but imagine he won't call. What allows us to clearly distinguish the meaning of I can but hope he won't call from that of I cannot but hope he won't call. The Oxford English Dictionary provides a plethora of examples of this highly polyvalent three-letter signifier, 
which can be used as a conjunction, preposition, adverb, adjective, or noun. Among those which interest us here, one finds. You say you are tied hand and foot. You'll never be but that in London. Not but that I should have gone if I had had the chance. I will not deny but that it is a difficult thing. I cannot deny but that it would be easy. She cannot miss but see us. I do not fear but that my grandfather will recover. A conflict seems to be played out in such expressions between a conscious or ego discourse and another agency which takes advantage of the possibility offered by English grammar and French grammar in the case of ne to manifest itself. This other agency, this non-ego or unconscious discourse interrupts the former, almost saying no, much in the same way as does a slip of, slip of the tongue. Lacan suggests that in such cases, we can take the French ne, and I would suggest that in English, we can take the somewhat ambiguous, or at least at times confusing use of but, as signifying the speaking or enunciating subject. Why as signifying? But here is not the name of the subject of enunciation. Rather, it points to a sort of no saying, a saying no. Lacan's term is dit que non. This but is a very strange bird, so strange indeed that there may be no other example like it in the whole English language, nor any other example like ne in the French language, non in Italian. Can we see any way of categorizing the word but as used in this kind of no saying? The word is clearly part of the code and insofar as it appears in the message, it seems to say something about the message, and more precisely about the speaker. But instead of simply designating who is speaking, it seems to tell us something about the speaker. In other words, that he or she is not entirely in agreement with what he or she is saying. It seems to point to an ambivalent speaker who says yes and no at the same time. Who, who while saying one thing, insinuates another. Whereas a shifter is the grammatical subject of the statement, the word but is a sort of naysaying that occurs in the act of speaking that is, during enunciation. No is said, and Lacan can be seen, in a sense, to be breaking down such messages or statements into two parts. So there's figure 4.1, which this is on page 40. So it says, statement, enunciated in brackets. I cannot deny but that it would be easy. And then it says, speaking, and then in brackets, enunciation, I cannot deny but that it would be easy. Oh no, the but is circled and moved down. I don't get it. The concepts code and message do not suffice here to qualify the term but in this instance. We are forced to refer to a sort of interference between the enunciated and enunciation. In other words, between that which is stated, the content, and the very act of stating or enunciating. The only subject Lacan allots to the statement is the conscious subject of the enunciated, represented here by the personal pronoun I. To qualify this subject, we need look no further than the linguistic categories code and message, that is, no further than strictly structural categories. The subject of the statement I is a shifter, an element of the code that refers to the message. The word but remains in a class by itself announcing the unconscious subject of enunciation, and thereby showing that the subject is split of two minds, so to speak, for and against, conscious and unconscious. Slips of the tongue also prove that there are two levels, but the Lacan of the early 1960s suggests that it is only in the case of ne and but that we seem to have constant or regular signifiers of the subject regular in that they appear regularly and often tag this other subject. Needless to say, many expressions in French and English that employ ne, but, or end, but, have become formulaic and fixed over time, to such a degree that one is virtually obliged to use them in tandem with certain other words. In French, for example, the verb craindre almost always requires one to use ne in the same breath. Nevertheless, every speaker in some sense chooses such pat expressions from the variety of ways of saying the same thing provided by the language in question. The fleetingness of the subject. 
Now this other subject, this enunciating subject signified by but in certain statements, is not something which, or someone who, has, has some sort of permanent existence. It only appears when a propitious occasion presents itself. It is not some kind of underlying substance or substratum. The unconscious as a continual playing out of a signifying chain excluded from consciousness, as described in chapter 2 and appendices 1 and 2, in which knowledge of a certain kind is embodied, is permanent in nature. In other words, it subsists throughout an individual's life. Yet its subject is in no sense permanent or constant. The unconscious as chain is not the same as the subject of the unconscious. In his seminar on the purloined letter, Lacan states that a signifier marks the cancellation of what it signifies. Ne and but sign the death sentence of the subject of the unconscious. The latter subsists only long enough to, pro to protest, to say no. Once the subject has said his or her piece, what he or she has said usurps his or her place. The signifier replaces him or her, or she van he or she vanishes. It is in that sense that he can say that ne and but are signifiers of the subject. The subject, as represented by Lacan's symbol, which is like an S, I don't know, like, with a thing over it. S for subject, and then that thing for barred. The subject is barred by language as alienated within the other, vanishes beneath or behind the signifier ne, designated here by S, a first signifier. Oh, designated here by S1, a first signifier. So we've got S1 over the S with the strike out, so the, um, the symbol for subject. Uh, and then in brackets, it says substitution of a signifier, S1, for the barred subject, um, the subject symbol. That signifier takes the subject's place, standing in for the subject who is now vanished. The subject has no other being than as a breach in discourse. The subject of the unconscious manifests itself in daily life as a fleeting eruption of something foreign or extraneous. Temporally speaking, the subject appears only as a pulsation, an occasional impulse or interruption that immediately dies away or is extinguished, expressing itself, as it does by means of the signifier. The Freudian subject. This provisional definition of the subject as breach imply, applies, however, more specifically to what one might call the Freudian subject than to the Lacanian subject. In his early study of Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life, and Jokes and Their Relation to the Unconscious, Lacan accustoms us to the idea of something which surges forth, as he says, at a particular conjuncture. In slips of the tongue, as in bungled actions and parapraxes of all kinds, some sort of alien intention seems to arrive on the scene or break its way in. Freud leads us to associate such intrusions with the unconscious, and thus it is quite natural that we attribute some of the intentionality, agency, or even subjectivity to it. We could provisionally consider this intruder as being, in a sense, the Freudian subject. Freud, of course, never introduces such a category, but I will use it here as a sort of shorthand for talking about a Freudian approach to the subject of the unconscious. For Freud, at one stage, makes the unconscious into a full-fledged agency, an agency seemingly endowed with its own intentions and will, a sort of second consciousness built, in some ways, on the model of the first. While Lacan certainly presents the unconscious as that which interrupts the formal flow of events, he never makes an agency of the unconscious. It remains a discourse divorced from consciousness and subjective involvement, the other's discourse, even as it interrupts the ego's discourse that is based on a false sense of self. To attribute subjectivity to Freud's unconsciousness as a breach, interruption, or eruption in discourse and other intentional activities.
in no way accounts for the specificity of Lacan's subject. Who then is the subject of the unconscious and how can it be situated? Before answering that question directly, let us continue to discern what that subject is not. The Cartesian subject and its inverse. One of the things that is so unusual about the Freudian subject is that it surges forth only to disappear almost instantaneously. There is nothing substantial about this subject. It has no being, no substratum or permanence in time. In short, nothing we are accustomed to look for when speaking of subjects. We have a sort of flash in the pan and then it is over. Lacan points out that Descartes' subject, the cogito, has a similarly short-lived existence. The Cartesian subject concludes that he is every time he says to himself, I am thinking. He must repeat to himself the words, I am thinking, in order to be able to convince himself that he exists. And as soon as he stops repeating those words, his conviction inevitably evaporates. Descartes is able to secure more permanent being for his subject by introducing God, the guarantor of so many things in the Cartesian universe. But Lacan focuses his analysis on the punctual, evanescent nature of the Cartesian subject. I will use two circles to illustrate what Descartes can be understood to have done here. He conceptualizes a point at which thinking and being overlap when the Cartesian subject says to himself, I am thinking, being and thinking coincide momentarily. Now there's like a figure 4.2, but honestly the picture is not um, rendered or showing properly on my version of the book. It's on page 43 though. It is the fact that he thinks that serves as the foundation for his being. Therein he joins thought to the, spe- to the speaking subject, I. To Lacan's mind, such a view is rather utopian. The subject, as he understands the term, cannot take refuge in an idyllic moment where thought and being coincide, but is rather forced to choose one or the other. He can have either thought or being, but never both at the same time. Figure 4.3 shows how one might schematize the Lacanian subject. Again, that figure is not really showing in my version of the book, but it's also on page 43 if you want to look. Why does Lacan thus turn Descartes' subject inside out, employing everything the cogito is not? Well, for one, Lacan's view of thought, like Freud's, revolves around unconscious thought, not the conscious thought studied by Descartes, the philosopher. Freud generally associates conscious thought with rationalization, and Lacan hardly grants it any more elevated status. Secondly, Descartes' subject who says I corresponds to the level of the ego, a constructed self taken to to be the master of its own thoughts, and whose thoughts are believed to correspond to external reality. Such a one-dimensional self believes that it is the author of its own ideas and thus has no qualms about affirming I think. This Cartesian subject is characterized by what Lacan calls false being in seminar uh, 15. And this false being manifests itself every time an an analysand says, I'm the kind of person who's independent and free thinking, or I did what I did because it was the magnanimous thing to do. And I always strive to be not only fair, but generous. A fixed self is posited in such statements, the unconscious being rejected. It is as though such an analysand were saying to his or her analyst, I can tell you all about myself because I know. I don't kid myself. I know where I stand. While thus beginning with the punctual or point-like Cartesian subject, that is the fleeting coincidence of thinking and being, Lacan turns Descartes on his head. Ego thinking is mere conscious rationalization. The ego's attempt to legitimate blunders and unintentional utterances by fabricating after the fact explanations which agree with the ideal self-image. And the being thus engendered can only be categorized as false or fake. Lacan thus seems to hold out for us some sort of prospect of a subject with true or real being that would be diametrically opposed to the false being of the ego. But this is not ultimately the case. The Lacanian subject remains separated from being, 
except in a sense that I shall come to f- come to further on. Lacan's f- split subject. Keeping in mind Lacan's own use of the term thinking to refer to unconscious thought as it unfolds in isolation from subjectivity, as discussed in chapter 2, let us consider one of Lacan's clearest graphic illustrations of what he calls the split or divided subject. It appears in seminar 14 and seminar 15, and it is presented here in figure 4.4. So, figure 4.4 on page 44. So, I am not thinking. And then there's like a circle with false being in brackets on top of it and being um, underneath. And then to the right, there's two circles like attached and it's either I am not thinking or I am not. Okay, so one circle is being and one circle is thinking. And then below there's um, the circle that is thinking and it underneath it says thinking. On the side it says I am not. And then on top in brackets it says unconscious thought. This schema will be discussed at length in the course of this chapter and chapter 6. Here I shall confine myself to noting some of its most striking features. The initial position in the schema, upper right-hand corner, provides one of Lacan's definitions of his subject. Either I am not thinking or I am not. The second am to be taken in the absolute sense of I am beingless. The either-or alternative means that one is obliged to situate oneself in some other corner of this schema. The path of least resistance, so to speak, is to refuse the unconscious, to refuse to pay attention to the thoughts unfolding in the unconscious. A sort of indulgence in false being, upper left-hand corner. Analysis, however, requires the individual to forego as far as possible this false being, to let unconscious thought have full sway. The subject is split between ego, upper left, and unconscious, lower right, between conscious and unconscious, between an an ineluctably false sense of self and the automatic functioning of language, the signifying chain in the unconscious. Our first attempt, then, to see what the Lacanian subject is comes down to the following. The subject is nothing but this very split. Lacan's variously termed split subject, divided subject, or barred subject, all written with the same symbol, consists entirely in the fact that a speaking being's two parts or avatars share no common ground. They are radically separated, the ego or false being requiring a refusal of unconscious thoughts, unconscious thought having no concern whatsoever for the ego's fine opinion of itself. This momentous split is a product of the functioning of language in us as we first begin to speak as children. It is equivalent to what I have been referring to as our alienation in language, discussed in detail in Chapter 5, and Lacan takes his lead here from Freud's concept of spaltung, as set forth in his 1938 paper, Die Ich, ich Paltung im Abwehrvorgang, <laughs> translated in the standard edition as splitting of the ego in the process of defense, but better rendered as splitting of the eye. The splitting of the eye into ego, false self, and unconscious brings into being a surface, in a sense, with two sides, one that is exposed and one that is hidden. Though the two sides may not ultimately be made of radically different material, linguistic in nature, at any given point along the surface there is a front and a back, a visible face and an invisible one. Their value may only be local, as in the case of the Mobius strip, where if you draw a long enough line along any side, you eventually wind up on the flip side due to the twist in the strip. Yet there is an at least locally valid split between front and back, conscious and unconscious. The split, while traumatic for each new speaking being, is by no means an indication of madness. On the contrary, Lacan states that in psychosis, the split cannot be assumed to have occurred at all. The unconscious being, Asiel, Ouvert, exposed for all the world to see. Unconscious-like thought processes are not hidden in psychosis as they are in the case of neurosis. Demonstrating that the split generally brought on by language assimilation has not occurred, 
and that there is something different about the psychotics being in language. The very notion of splitting as produced by our alienation within language can serve as a diagnostic tool, enabling the clinician to distinguish in certain cases neurosis from psychosis. While this split has nothing in common with the kind of agency we tend to associate with subjectivity, it is nevertheless already a first step beyond structure. Language as other does not automatically make a subject of a homo sapiens child. It can misfire, as it does in psychosis. This split is not something that can be explained in strictly linguistic or combinatory terms. It is thus an excess of structure. Though the subject is nothing here but a split between two forms of otherness, the ego as other and the unconscious as the other's discourse, the split itself stands in excess of the other. As we shall see in the next chapter, the advent of the split subject signals a corresponding division or breakdown of the other. Beyond the split subject. Now the split subject is by no means Lacan's last word on subjectivity, there being a further aspect to the subject which I will first attempt to illustrate graphically and then explain in the next two chapters. Let us return to the illustration of the split subject presented in figure 4.4, and note, firstly, that not only is the subject split here between ego and unconscious, it is further split in each of the two opposing corners of the schema, upper left and lower right. For the moment, let us simply take up the split at the level of the unconscious. In the excluded, unshaded portion of the circle in the lower right-hand corner, Lacan writes I. In this case, it is not the reified I of conscious discourse found in statements of the I am like this and not like that type. Nor is it the empty shifter, a signifier whose referent changes with each new person who pronounces it. It is rather the eye of Freud's wo es war sol ich worden, a veritable leitmotif in Lacan's work. The gist of Lacan's many glosses on it involves a morally dictated movement from the impersonal it, form, and not the id per se, for Freud says neither das es nor das ich here, as he usually does when designating the agencies of the id and the ego, to I. I must become I where it was or reigned. I must come to be, must assume its place, that place where it was. I here appears as the subject that analysis aims to bring forth, an I that assumes responsibility for the unconscious, that arises there in the unconscious linking up of thoughts which seems to take place all by itself without the intervention of anything like a subject. This I, or subject of the unconscious, as we might call it, is in general excluded at the level of the unconscious thought. It comes into being, so to speak, only momentarily as a sort of pulse-like movement towards the lower left-hand corner of the schema. So we've got figure 4.5, which is a dark circle with like, a little whitened slice that says I, and it says thinking over the top of the circle. Figure 4.6 is just a round white circle with an arrow pointing to it from the right. But while it is just as evanescent or short-lived a subject as that of the interruptions known as slips of the tongue and bungled actions, this specifically Lacanian subject is not so much an interruption as the assumption thereof, in the French sense of the term assomption, that is an acceptance of responsibility for that which interrupts a taking it upon oneself. For Lacan claims that one is always responsible for one's position as subject. His concept of the subject thus has an ethical component that finds its founding principle in Freud's Woes War Sol ich Worden. Thus we begin with an alienated subject that is no other than the split itself. So we got figure 4.7. This is on page 47, where it's a black circle with like a little white piece on the right hand side. It says being underneath. And then like further down into the right, there's another black circle with a white piece on the left side this time. And underneath it says thinking. But there is a sense in which the split subject, the subject is alienated, is able to go beyond or overcome this division through a shift or movement towards the lower left-hand corner of the schema. The split is, in a sense, the condition of the possibility of the existence of a subject. 
the pulsation-like shift seeming to be its realization. While the split corresponds to alienation, the second aspect of the Lacanian subject as I was presenting it here, or as I am presenting it here, corresponds to separation. These two operations will be explored at length in the next chapter.